Hey everybody, Juan here. Welcome back for this video. Let's talk about the Xbox Game Pass service for the Xbox console and cover some of the games that I personally think are absolutely worth your time. I know that many of us are currently stuck in our homes and we want to play a lot of video games, but maybe we don't have all of that bandwidth to download 20, 30 games. And after that entire process, you're like, wait a minute. I thought I was going to like this, but I didn't, so I wasted all of that time. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about three games that I personally have been playing during the last one to two months. Whenever I want to disconnect, all three games are violent in their own respective matter. In that last game that I'm going to be talking about, people, there's a reason I got to save that game for the last block there. But before we keep going, if you like what I do, consider subscribing, clicking on that bell, going down to the comment section, and let me know which games have you been playing recently. For this first game, we're going to be going into the action RPG genre, and this is a game that I already wanted to play before I even found out it was going to be part of Xbox Game Pass. So in that number one block, we got to talk about Children of Morta. This is an action RPG that's mainly meant to be played by one person, but you can't play with a friend in local co-op. And much like other games that have come out within the last few years, this game is a roguelike game, which means that you have a combination of permanent and temporary upgrades. There are procedurally generated elements, so this way, every time you play this game, you're guaranteed to have a unique experience. As you progress through the game, you gain gold and upgrade your character, including leveling up, etc. And you can use that gold once you die or once you complete a set amount of stages to permanently upgrade your character, whether it be more health, uh, more attack, faster speed. It really depends on the experience that you want to have. You do get access to multiple characters. In my case, I've kept on playing with the base one because by the time I kept unlocking other ones, I'm like, wait a minute, the other ones are only level one. I already have a, a little bit of time dedicated into this primary character and personally that has not been a problem and that increases my longevity with the game because say I get a little bit tired of this character but I love the game. I can just pick another one and I can have myself a brand new experience. While you're exploring these different dungeons, you get access to different special abilities, such as a vortex that sucks enemies in, you can find a teammate that grants you the ability to heal, or even find this awesome flaming orbit that damages enemies. And talking about the basic structure of the combat mechanics, in my case, with the main character, he has a sword and shield, so that means that I can block with the shield, but I can actually stab the enemies around, but I'm gonna do that a little bit slower. Now, I can attack without the shield, but that does expose me to different types of damage. And you can get pretty good at dodging enemy attacks, but you gotta be careful because you do have a stamina meter, and based on all the footage you've seen, you can see this game is stunning. Everything about it just screams high quality. Say you go into a game like this, but you really would like to be able to enjoy a bit of a story. And it's sometimes challenging with games like this where they expect you to die and go back and go back time and time again. You have a story about a family, a story of corruption, the fight for survival and honor for that family. And the way that everything is told is that every time you die, or many of the times that you die, you're treated to these very awesome cutscenes that are narrated by this person that has a great voice. As the Bergsons of old had done in the past, they would need the assistance of the sanctuary. And what I love is that every time you die, you go back to this hub world, this mansion, and not only is that the place where you can spend upgrades, etc., but there you can actually choose to move around, look around, and you see the different members of your family. If you just want to play this game because you're looking for the next action RPG, you do not have to focus on the story. I've had gameplay sessions where I'm just sitting down and I'm playing it, but I'm also watching a stream, so it becomes a secondary experience. Is that insulting to the game? I'm, I mean, hopefully not, right? But I'm still having a blast playing this. And the other thing is that they have these different mini games. If you complete these, you get gold, you get upgrades. I played Pong, I played Memory, and I think it's the developer's way of saying like, hey, yeah, this is a pretty serious story, but at the end of the day, this is a video game and we're not gonna take ourselves too seriously. If you're looking for a game that you can play for 30 minutes to an hour each day, not dedicate that whole lot of time, but still make some progress, Children of Morta is still damn good and definitely worth your time. Now this next game is one that came out all the way back in 2017, and I've actually had it on my computer, but never got around to playing it. We gotta talk about Ruiner. I gotta start this by saying that I am so sad and disappointed that it took me this long to play Ruiner. It's a cyberpunk overhead action shooter, or as I like to call it, a badass simulator. You play as this silent protagonist that apparently they like to call Puppy, 
Not Poppy, Puppy. He doesn't talk with his words. He has a helmet that actually portrays the different things he wants to say. As you go through the game and make those decisions, you actually see them play out and that's how the other individuals see what he's trying to convey. In regards to what I love about this game, damn it has style. From the graphics, the movement, the environments, the cutscenes, feels like everybody just sat down in this meeting and it's like, look, we want everything about this game to just ooze style, ooze charisma. And honestly, I just always wanted to just say ooze in a video, so that just happened. This game is all about the movement, and that surprised me a lot because going into this, what piqued my interest with the trailers was, well, it's all sorts of violent, and it is, and you can clearly see that right now. You can dash around, you can also hold down that button, you enter into the slow motion mode, and you can sneak behind some characters. You can then choose to put up a barrier, and if you upgrade that barrier, their ammo can actually repel right back at them. So it is completely all about how you wanna play that game. Say you got yourself an upgrade and it's not what you asked for, it's not what you expected. You can actually go right back to that menu, you can undo that and assign that skill point to something else. They know that this is a game for people that love action movies, for people that love things like The Matrix. I'm the ultimate badass, like people are so deftly afraid of me, and even if they're not, they really should be. This has a lot more in common with the twin stick shooter than everything else because with the left thumbstick, you move the character, but with the right one, that's how you change where he's actually looking at. The right shoulder trigger is for the gun, the right bumper is for the melee weapon, and you may be taking all this in and thinking, this is a little bit convoluted, a little bit complicated, and honestly, it is. If there's one thing that's both great and not so great about this game is that you can feel very overwhelmed. It's definitely something that may be a turn off for some others. So that's why I'm bringing it up right now because I don't wanna give you this false perspective about this game that's gonna be perfect and, and there's nothing bad about it. Runer is amazing, I love playing it, but if you do not give yourself time to really familiarize yourself with those controls, you're not gonna make a lot of progress, although you can change difficulty whenever you want. So say you just wanna have the visual experience. You can change that to easy, and even though it's not like ultra easy or anything else like that, you're definitely gonna have a less challenging time than with any other difficulty. Once you figure out a specific pattern for an enemy, that rewarding feeling that you get, I don't play the games like Dark Souls, etc., but I can imagine it somewhat similar where you understand what the game's all about. You know where you wanna get to, so please, if you haven't, consider downloading Ruiner. And before we get to the last game, here are a couple of quick recommendations based on what you left in the comments. Matthew recommends we all play Enter the Gungeon, My Friend Pedro, and Dead Cells, which is one of my favorite games of all time, so if you have not played it, please subscribe to Game Pass and play it. Javier recommended Pathologic 2, stating, it is a great game on the Game Pass that misses so much recognition. This game is labeled as a first-person horror RPG, and it does have very positive reviews. So if you're looking for a game that you're going to be scared and you want to be able to explore that world, then maybe this one is up your alley. And Emo Popcorn recommended we all play Mamadora. This is a sequel to an ongoing 2D side-scrolling action series, and I've always wanted to play, but I've just never had a chance to, even though I actually downloaded it on Xbox Game Pass, so if you've played it, please go down to the comments and let me know what you think of it. Now people, I said this last game is very violent. If you've been offended by games like Ruiner and Children of Morta, I strongly suggest you look away because what you're about to see is so incredibly violent that children and people across the world could just cry for hours upon hours. And instead of talking about this, let's transition. Oh man, Lonely Mountains Downhill. This game is the epitome of why I love Xbox Game Pass. I never intended to play this game. I saw it under recently added. I'll download it. Maybe I talk about it in a video. And if I don't like it, I'll delete it. Then I sat down and I kept playing it. My wife comes in, sees me playing it. She picks it up. Then two friends come over. They pick it up, they play it. It is the obsession of something so simple, so beautiful, and so satisfying, which is you're one man or one woman, and you're going downhill alone. 
that's pretty much it. But what happens along the way is just so enjoyable to watch. Whether you're bad or good, it's either going to be impressive or you're going to be laughing out loud for a very long time. It is an objective-based time trial game that's all about that trial and error. You have multiple mountains and you want to get down them and then try to do that as fast as possible. You see traditional track that you even see, it's pretty obvious where you gotta go. But as you continue to progress in the game, you see and you're like, wait a minute, I think I can sneak behind that tree and I can chop down 30 seconds. But then you'll see multiple shortcuts. I'm talking about 20 to 30 different paths. You almost want to hit that reset button because you know you can do a better job. But then the challenge is that with every shortcut, the game gets just that much harder. By you being able to either go down the traditional path or these hidden routes, that means that you make this game as hard or as easy as you want. And when I say easy, that in no way means like, hey, it's gonna be a breeze, you go down. No, you're gonna be dying a lot. Like a lot. You gotta look at the game and love its sense of simplicity. Not just in the graphics, I'm talking about the music and the soundtrack because there is no music. The soundtrack is the birds, the wind, the sound of the bike going downhill. Between these three games, the one that I played the most has got to be Lonely Mountains Downhill. Say you beat a stage, then you can go back and challenge yourself to do it without falling 10, 14 times. And if we had to talk about things that I would improve about this game, honestly, I don't really know. I love the gravity, the weight of the bicycle, everything works and it's not this incredibly complicated game. It very much understands what it is going for, it delivers it, and instead of talking more about the good or bad things about it, I think I just gotta roll some more clips and uh, just let you see what kind of experience I had playing this game. No! Oh no! I love how frustrating yet relaxing this game is. No! I'm being careful because... No! I crashed in the same spot. I think I skipped multiple checkpoints in this shortcut and that's why I'm not getting any right now. My God, no, no. <laughs> and I have to share this amazing moment where I was talking to Nicole, looking away from screen. I let go of the controller and look at what happened. Wait, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Did that just happen? And friends, those right there were three games I strongly, strongly recommend you consider playing on Xbox Game Pass in addition to the quick recommendations. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, please go down to the comment section and let me know, have you played any of these games? And if you haven't, let me know what you're currently playing on Xbox Game Pass. I love the service because especially now that we are just in our homes, we wanna play a ton of different video games. It does provide this incredible opportunity for us to be able to play these games that we may have otherwise never played in our lives. So if you like what I do, if this video was pretty good for you, please consider subscribing, clicking on the bell, and up until next time, thank you for watching and supporting, and take care, everybody.